Hey guys, Dr. Sil here, junior doctor in Sydney, Australia. And uh, on this episode of Doctors Getting Coffee, I have the absolute pleasure and honor of having a chat with uh, Professor David Morris. Now, Professor David Morris is the head of the peritonectomy and liver surgery unit at St. George Hospital. He's also a clinical academic. You have a professorship with the uh, UNSW, which is my old university. And I remember fondly the early morning, Friday morning lectures that we did in his office. Thank you very much for those. Um, and uh, today did, I, did I still have a water pistol when, when we did that? I think it was the group before where the water pistol retired. <laughs> so if it was anyone's uh, turn to speak, <laughs> you wanted to go with your anatomy prepared, that's for sure. That's right. So today I want to talk a little bit about um, your life, your journey in this incredible thing we call medicine. Um, but I thought I'd start with uh, a bit of a different question. And it's um, a question about fear and, and the operating theatre because, you know, medical students and, and me as well, you know, even holding a retractor can be a bit of a scary thing. Even scrubbing for the first time, making sure you don't touch certain things, it can be, it can be scary uh, being in an operating theatre. It's a different world. And, you know, someone with as, as much experience as you, I was just curious, do you, do you ever get scared in the operating theatre anymore? Uh, very, very um, seldom. Um, I, I guess that um, it's a mixture of um, probably um, stupidity on my part for not being um, afraid. Um, but I, it's not very often that I feel, feel afraid of things. Um, in terms of traumas, when you have people who have lost a great deal of blood and are actively bleeding, I think those are, uh, it, it, you know, you, you kind of feel in those cases, well, this isn't my fault. I, I didn't do this. It's not like, and all you're doing is fixing it up. And so, um, yeah, I don't feel fear. Yeah, you just, you're just trying to make it better. So, That's right. you, yeah, your responsibility is just to make yeah. it as good as possible. That's but right. There are some times where you can't yeah. do anything. No. And uh, that can, I'm sure, be challenging at times. Um, and, did you feel fear when you were younger, like as a junior surgeon or in medical school, or was it always um, not really a... I must say that I've really enjoyed um, surgery an awful lot. Um, and it's a, it can be a tremendously positive thing. Now, sure, when something bad happens and you lose somebody because of that, then it can also be a very um, hard thing. But um, almost all of the time, it's it's a very um, rewarding thing to be doing. Yeah. Was, was there a pivotal case in your life that kind of brought you to the direction of surgery, or were you playing with surgical tools oh, as a child? When I was a well, that's a good question. When I was a child, I made literally hundreds of airfix kits. Airfix kits, what's that? They're aeroplanes and tanks oh. and ships and so on. I actually thought I had a bit of a problem, really, uh, because I made hundreds of these kits and they had, Did to, you paint them they as had well? to be perfect. Oh, very yes. nice. And uh, when I went to university, I actually was quite bored. The first few years of um, medical school was kind of anatomy and physiology and um, biochemistry and Krebs cycle and ah, you know, it was dreadful. <laughs> and um, and then I, I kind of joined a clinical uh, team, a surgical team, and I got to go to theatre and to scrub that day and I stayed there all day and I stayed there all night and I stayed there the next day and I thought, hmm, this could be fun. And really I've never ever doubted that that's what I wanted to do from then on. Um, I've often thought I'm not good enough to do this, I'm never going to pass this next bloody exam or whatever, or I'm not going to get the job. But I've never had to doubt that I wanted to do it and that I enjoyed it. I think that's a really good marker of if you've found your calling is that you're staying back. Yeah. You're not looking at the clock anymore. No. You're in a flow state. Yeah. And that's something I, like, I wish I would I love I, working with your hands and fixing problems with your hands yeah. is a beautiful thing mm. and uh, that's what I love about surgery is that mm. it's tactile mm. and it, you still have the connection with patients but mm. um, it, yeah, it's hard work that's for sure 
Now, the doubts that you get about getting a certain job or getting passing a certain exam, how did you kind of um, confront it or like get past that? I did the exam again and again and again and again and again, <laughs> and again yeah. until I, yeah, that's right. Until you learned it. it. Yeah. Um, and in terms of getting jobs, um, I was very lucky um, in the sort of jobs that I got. Um, and um, I had some great people um, who were, um, you know, very um, motivating and um, helpful in steering me, um, you know, towards um, research and, yeah. How early on did you get involved in research? Well, I was a registrar mm. um, and to be honest, I did research because in England I knew that if I didn't um, do research, I wouldn't get on. Right. And so I, I did it because I knew I needed to do it. But then I kind of got bitten and um, I've never stopped doing research. And I've written nearly a thousand manuscripts and um, I have a H index which is um, quite good, um, about 70. Um, and I've written a few books, and to be, to be honest, there are a few more books that I should write. Right. Um, but I, I really enjoy the research, and it's, it's a kind of thing that, um, it's like bragging, but it's, it's kind of, um, it's real. You know, you actually have done something. Um, today I was talking to some colleagues about the fact that we got two US issued patents last week and again that's a, a kind of a you know it, it, it's a real thing and it does mean that you've actually achieved something and yeah it's good right and that's with I feel like we need to take a step back and go because you, you so you were born in England is that right oh yes okay yeah. right so let's because I can just hear the accent but it's yes. subtle yeah. uh, so you were born whereabouts and, and where did you grow I up I grew up in Herefordshire which is where the cows come from on a farm oh, yeah. and my father was absolutely disgusted with me that I wished to do medicine. Oh, what did he do? And oh, he was a businessman um, and we had a company um, with trucks and warehouses and mills and oh, so sure. on and he was very cross with me that I went to the medicine and when I decided I'd come to Australia he was even more cross with me um, and we sort of seldom talked for a while wow. uh, but then when I got my first decent farm in Australia, he kind of softened a bit. And, um, you know, when I got a, a really good farm in Australia, he, he kind of began to, you know, take an interest again. I didn't know this was one of your interests. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, was, so you got the skills of farming, because farming is not no, easy No, I didn't thing. get the it's skills. Easy. It's a no. congenital disease right. for me. But um, the skills, I, I had a farm of my own in England before I came here, but even then uh, I had a very steep learning curve in Australia because sheep farming, which is mainly what I've, what I've done, it, is quite different in Australia. It's, uh, um, it, 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 it's very different from England. In what way? Is it the, the environment? Well, is it the sheep themselves? Are they more yes. aggressive? No, they're not <laughs> aggressive. Um, it, it's much drier here, and so um, it's not as intensive. Um, and the sheep here, we have two flocks now. We have a merino flock, um, and they produce fine wool, and they produce crossbred lambs. And then we have a crossbred flock, which um, you know are sort of good for meaty lambs. Um, and um, in England, um, there are no merinos, or at least there's no interest in merino wool. It's just, um, you know, meat production. Wow, mm. that's, that's so interesting. And um, did you see, like, did, did that in, ignite any interest in anatomy when you saw sheep being, you know, butchered and things? Because no. surgeons were initially butchers on the yes. battlefield. That's right, isn't Quite. it? Quite, yeah. yeah. No, I don't think I really no. uh, did much of that. Okay. And so you did medical school um, in England. Yep. And how did you, you said it was a bit boring. Was that because it was easy or because it wasn't, um, you weren't connecting with it in an intellectual level? Oh, so much of the first years was just kind of um, learning um, it with no um, sort of context of um, 
usefulness or importance. Mm. Um, and uh, I'm not good at that. I like to it kind becomes of, arbitrary. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so did you do your junior doctor years there? When, when did oh, you I was come a, across? I, yeah, I was a consultant surgeon there before oh. I came here. Um, but I, I did all my um, junior years and registrar years and um, fellow years um, oh. there. And then I became a consultant um, surgeon in Nottingham um, in an academic um, post. Um, and uh, then I, I came here um, after I'd been a consultant for three or four years. And other than the Merino, what drew you to Australia? A, a personality defect of my own. Right. Um, in that um, I really wanted to have my own department and um, you know, decide what I was going to uh, do. And in the UK, all the, although I'd get shortlisted for chairs of surgery, they'd appoint guys that were 15 years older than me at the time. And I just worked out that I wasn't really prepared to wait. Um, and then I, I looked at a few jobs abroad in Canada and then here. But this was the first one that I then applied for. And why Canada or here? Because I thought they had reasonable health services. Whereas in the States, I don't think I could ever have quite sort of um, settled into the um, system of medicine. And Prof, what were some of the challenges with setting up your own department? Uh, I guess that when I came here, I thought that there would be so much politics oh. that um, I would probably operate on a lot of rats and um, write quite a few papers. And But I, I found that I really became clinically very busy um, because I concentrated on something that people weren't interested in the time, which was metastatic disease in the liver and then the lung and then the peritoneum. And it, it was certainly the case when I came that those patients were not um, being um, offered very much at all. Um, and it was um, then quite um, useful to um, develop um, this department to mm. concentrate on that. Did you uh, get involved with peritonectomy proceed? I mean, you're one of the first to do it in Australia, is that right? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you kind of were at the forefront and you led it. Yeah. Um, was it happening overseas? Did you learn about it in, the, yeah. um, in England and bring it over? Or I, what I was, was the origin of the peritonectomy yeah. uh, procedure? I was the uh, American College of Surgeons traveling scholars, uh, scholar in the mid 80s, I don't remember which year. And I went to a number of places in the States that I was thought were doing interesting work. And one of those places was Paul Sugarbaker. Uh, and Paul was doing um, extensive cytoreductive surgery and intraperitoneal chemo, not at the time HIPEC. And I thought he was mad, and I think I probably told him so. Um, and then his first decent paper came out in 95. Um, and I realized that the results in that paper could not be achieved by other treatments in that he had long-term survivors of patients with colon cancer with peritoneal disease and appendiceal cancer with um, peritoneal disease. And I wrote to him and said, sorry, I got that wrong. Will you, you know, will you show me how to do this? And he's been very generous over the years in um, teaching me um, how to how to do it, and we have an organisation in the world called Soggy, um, which is has also been um, very useful around the development of peritoneal um, cancer treatment. Um, and um, yeah, we started off as a small band um, of people, and I think our first meeting we had about ten or fifteen people. Um, in the world at this meeting. and These are proceduralists performing oh, yeah. the procedure? Right. Yeah. And then the last meeting we had, there were over a thousand people at it. And so it, it's kind of, uh, but that's sort of 20 years. Um, so, I mean, I can assume what you find amazingly fulfilling about your role and, you know, what would be really nice about your job to yeah. be able to deliver this care and uh, kind of extend people's lives by yeah. such significance. But what do you find, like, 
what, what, what do you love about your job? Um, well, th there's no doubt that there is a, a technical um, sort of fascination in being able to do harder and harder and harder things safely. And um, our mortality for peritonectomy is now of the order of 1%, unless you have you know, high risk um, features. Um, and we've done well over one and a half thousand of those procedures um, here. What's the, the real buzz? Uh, apart from that, I think that the real buzz is seeing the patients years afterwards and knowing that you've actually changed what has happened to them and what is now sort of routinely available. And I, I've certainly had a few fights over the years with um, the government and um, colleagues and so on about um, you know the availability of these services. Um, and yeah, I guess it's it's uh, ended well. I think that people have a much better um, chance of being treated now than they did. I guess when you're kind of pioneering a, a new procedure, yep. um, there's always going to be friction. Yep. And uh, how do you go about kind of dealing with that friction when uh, you have a new idea? You know, healthcare is very risk averse. It's hard yep. to have a startup in healthcare because yep. if you start Uber and you, you know it's a startup, the worst thing that can happen is someone misses an Uber. Yeah. If you screw up a startup in in healthcare, yeah. it, can, it can cost people's lives. It's oh, a yeah. different risk threshold. Yeah. So when you're, because you have your own company, but also you, you develop your own procedure, you're very innovative as, a, as an individual. How did you uh, kind of overcome the barriers and friction from your colleagues or the departments? Uh... I'm, st I'm still working on it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's an active progress. Is that right? Um, I think that at the end of the day, data is kind of one of the important things, and. One of the reasons that I follow up all my patients sort of forever is A, so that I know what the results are. So we've actually got our own um, database with um, outcomes. And the other reason is to cheer me up in that seeing patients that you've helped, um, you know, as opposed to seeing 20 or so patients in the ward that we've just done huge operations on, um, is a good way of staying sane. Mm. And how big is your team at the moment? It, just the clinical team. I, I should specify which team I'm talking yeah. about. <laughs> yeah, we've got about ten guys on the team, and we yeah. have we have fellows from um, other parts of the world that come to be trained, which is good. I find that when you get to that number, it's um, there's a lot of different uh, you know personalities, and the dynamics on the ward can be yeah. challenging. How do you uh, kind of orchestrate that? Well, as a leader, you're leading this team in their yeah. care. How do you manage uh, such a big uh, team of clinicians? Hmm. Um, I, I, I guess I'm sort of fairly strict about, you know, um, uh, about what's going to be done and how it's going to be done and um, so on. Um, but I think I'm also, I also put a lot of effort into this myself. And perhaps I don't get a lot of, um, pushback from people because they can see that I'm committed to this. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I work hard at this. You do. I, but So when you aren't working, yeah. uh, what, what do you do to kind of uh, switch off? Or is that not like this idea of work-life balance, is that not something you um, kind of buy into? Because it is a bit of a marketing tool from, I think, I don't know, the 80s yeah. or something. I don't play golf. Yeah. Well, right. Okay. I, I don't watch much telly. Right. Um, and uh, I, but I really do enjoy um, reading, um, and there's so much. Um, and as you know, we've developed a few drugs over the years. Um, and, and actually, in retrospect, one of the most useful things I've done with my life was that I was involved in developing albendazole for um, Hydatid a long time ago. Um, and that was quite silly why, why I could have done that. And I think that was kind of um, why I've always um, been trying to then develop other, um, other drugs. And it, one of the drugs we're working on at the moment has now um, got really quite wide application outside of the mucinous cancers that I developed it for. And so I found that I had to read so much about respiratory disease. Um, and 
Um, and it's really been quite interesting and the science of respiratory disease. And now we've got a, a lab working on that. Um, which, two, right? Two labs, <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. There's multiple labs on the, in the hospital that, uh, yeah. that you're running. Yeah. Um, and they're working on, uh, on this um, medicine, um, what's okay. it called? Yeah, Bro what's the rundown? Bromac. Bromac, okay. So Bromac is yeah. a, a combination of bromelain, which is an enzyme or a series of enzymes from the stem of the pineapple plant, together with N-acetylcysteine. And um, we were screening for a, a drug to dissolve a highly mucinous tumor called pseudomyxoma. And we went through heaps of drugs and nothing worked. And then I said, well, okay, just start combining things and see what works. And one day, um, a combination worked very well. And we then worked out the science of why that was. Wow, so you um, actually, you, you made the observation and then worked out the science yeah. rather than trying to predict it, it based it, off science. It wasn't the other way around, that's right. It was just chance that we found something and then we worked out why. And then that has um, broader applications than just in mucinous tumors, yeah. Well, it, and it, it might clear the spike proteins, or it does clear the it spike does. proteins on the yeah. different coronavirus yeah. species. That's and I, I think that, Yes, it, in, in COVID, we um, started off on the spike protein, but I think that there are other um, effects. We, we, we did some work in Brazil just recently, where we, um, which has just been published, where we took sputum from intubated COVID patients, and then we... Um, used our drug on, on that and showed that we could um, fluidize their really sticky sputum within about 10 minutes. So maybe an aerosolized kind of treatment and could be really effective for that's chest. Right. We're, um, we're doing that, yeah. And that is applicable to, I think, other causes of ARDS apart from, um, apart from COVID. And the other interesting things in COVID is that the cytokines and chemokines that are in their airway, which drive the inflammatory um, problems. Our drug cleaves those, and so I think it will have quite good anti-inflammatory action in the respiratory tree as well. I mean, N-acetylcysteine is something we learn about to give for a, uh, an overdose of Panadol. Yes. A and then to hear that yes. it's you, you found a, way, a use for it that is so different to a hepatic metabolism of yeah. that innovations. Did you always have this innovative kind of mind while you were going through your training? Were you seeing procedures and thinking there was opportunities to improve the whole way along? Or was it something more, once you were established, you started looking for problems no, to I've solve? I've done a, pretty strange, a number of pretty strange things along the way, you know. What, what was one of the first early ones? What, what's one of the first things that well, one you, of my you changed? One of my favorite ones was um, cryo, which is um, freezing tumors. And um, again, when I was in the States in uh, mid 80s, I, I met up with a guy there who was interested in cryo as well. Um, and we then both developed cryo for treating cancer, but I basically made a machine in the, in the garage. And um, we, we treated people um, with that. And then it got better and we got an engineer and the engineer made a lot of improvements and so on and so on. But, um, developing things um, is is good fun, and um, the uh, the kind of uh, safety side of it is clearly something that we're um, as doctors we're used to, and we're used to also working out whether something is really ethical or not, and. If you've got, and fortunately, most of the patients that I have worked on developing treatments for do not have other good options. And even now with the, with the COVID stuff and the uh, respiratory stuff, we are only treating people that don't have good options. If you've been on a ventilator for 24 hours and you're not improving, we don't have an awful lot left for you. So, um, you know, and, and that makes innovation and the ethics of innovation a lot easier. Makes it a bit more simple, yeah. 
Um, one of the questions from one of the subscribers, um, by the way, massive thanks to your um, administrative staff who oh, yeah. set this up in such a uh, quick time, but I, I just sent out a message to some of the subscribers to see if they had any questions to ask. But one of them was, how um, can you get involved in drug development as a doctor, but not let it bias you in, in your therapies? Oh, I think that's a, that's a um, constant concern. But on the other hand, um, you're, you have to move beyond what you do yourself in that, uh, for example, in the, in the first work we did with Bromac, we did that here. It's now uh, in phase two studies in um, Europe. It's and, phase two? Yeah. I didn't know that. That's, that's, that's very exciting. And so, uh, and that's something that I, I kind of, you know, I'm not involved in. And so, and when you, clearly when you write your results of stuff that you've done yourself, you declare what your um, involvement is. And so, yeah, I, I, I get it. Um, and, but kidding yourself is not a very smart thing because, um, you know, it's going to get repeated. It, one of the happiest um, days I had about two years ago was when an American um, scientist actually repeated our work um, and extended An it. independent body. Independent. You, hadn't not... even talked to us, wow. just, just did it. And that was, that was really good because um, I always tell the guys in the lab, it's really good when you give me crap results because it means at least I know you're being honest. You know what I mean? And you have to be honest with yourself about stuff. I mean, that's one of the like, core beautiful things about research is that it's an approximation of reality, yeah. this complex thing. And so yeah. if you just, you know, yeah, as you say, you can't lie to yourself because you're no. trying to approximate reality and other people will use yeah. your tools to yeah. do that uh, yeah. in their labs. And if yeah. it's different, then you've got a big problem on your hands. Yeah. Um, and, that's, and that's how I feel as well. If you're getting involved in drug development, I mean, what's the alternative you don't? Yeah, and then there are right. no, there, there's no doctors involved in drug development. <laughs> and, that's and, a pretty and, bad recipe. We do need to be, because exactly. you can be the smartest scientist in the world, but if you actually don't know what the problem is and what would be suitable for that and what would make it not um, a sort of a useful thing, then you're lost. And so you do need a bit of both. That is. Iconic, that, and there's a quote from Elon Musk that's, that, that kind of summarizes this in terms of engineering, but it's so true in medicine as well that like, um, the most common thing he sees is engineers optimizing things that shouldn't exist. Yeah, that's right. It's that's like not... you've got to know what, like, why yeah. are we making this medicine? Why are we developing this, yeah. this tool? Is yeah. it, do you need this, this tool? Yeah. Um, but it sounds like a lot of your innovation has been in, in terms of uh, kind of pharmacology. Yeah. Um, from a, as a surgeon, what, yeah. what about the tools that you use intraoperatively? Are you involved in kind of? You made the cryo machine. Yeah. Did you do other? Yeah, is I've that, done yeah. other ablation devices. Right. For, um, I, I I did bipolar RF. That was um, I, I worked a lot on that. And uh, for the medical students who don't know what that is, oh, <laughs> um, RF is radio frequency ablation mm. and. Um, it's a way of basically um, cooking tumors. Oh, okay. And what we did was, with a probe. Mm, oh, direct, and, what, yeah. and what we did was make bipolar probes, which made the cooking um, better and faster and bigger. Um, wow. Anyway, outstanding. So, um, how then can a clinician get involved in in being more innovative? Uh, do you have any advice, or uh, how would I go about, you know, becoming a more innovative doctor? Mm. Look at the problems. Do you believe in uh, asking for forgiveness rather than permission? It's, that might be. <laughs> uh, oh, look! I think that question. the um, you know the system of regulation of what we do has to um, exist and has to work. Mm. And um, I don't um, I don't think that that's uh, one thing I've done this year. Um, which is a bit naughty, is that um, when we developed Bromac for respiratory use, um, I used it myself. Oh. Um, mm. And I wouldn't um, you know, even think of doing clinical trials until I'd used it myself. Wow. And um, at much higher doses than, you know, and, you know, was that, had the ethics committee approved of that? No, no, they hadn't. I just did that. Um, 
Well, on the other hand, you know, I'd love someone to try and tell me that that was something that I shouldn't have done because it, for me, it meant that I was then pretty happy that the safety side of it was okay. And I certainly wouldn't want to have done it to other people before I was happy. My, my first cannula was in a stroke code and I completely missed. And it was, <laughs> I, I just told the registrar, it was a, uh, a term with a neurology team, I won't say which hospital, and I, uh, I, I had never done one before, just done it on a dummy yeah. months earlier, forgotten how to do it. And then they were like, can you do one? I was like, I've practiced, but it'll be good to do it first. They're like, sure, it's an emergency, it's a resus, this person's yeah. hemiplegic. Yeah. And, and after that horrible experience of missing and hurting this poor patient, yeah. should have done it on the hemiplegic side, really. Anyway, <laughs> um, I, 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 I did it on myself to get it first. I said, I'm not doing this on a patient until I can do it on myself one-handed. Yeah. And 10 attempts, <laughs> it took me, but then you got it. I got it, <laughs> got and uh, it's a great feeling. And then uh, I have a pretty good success rate ever since. <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing your time. A final question, um, yeah. really for the medical students uh, and junior doctors like me. Like uh, by a lot of estimations, I'd say you've you've had a very uh, successful and what looks like a very fulfilling career. And I was wondering if you had any kind of advice for anyone uh, wanting to, to 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 follow similar footsteps in in their in their career. Um, well, if you find something that you really enjoy, then it's a pretty good idea to do it. Thank you. That's it. Professor, academic, farmer, <laughs> Professor David Morris, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. My pleasure. Thank all you. the best, guys. And I'll see you all in the next video. Bye for now. That was great. Good. Thank you very much.